Hi, everybody. What a beautiful Lord's Day it's been. I hope you've gotten an opportunity to get out and at least walk around your yard a little bit and the property and, and be able to take a deep breath and enjoy the sunshine that God has blessed us with today. Beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. Do want to mention, though, to keep uh, Debbie's co-worker in your prayer. Uh, one of her co-workers has passed away and pray that you'll keep that family in your prayers uh, in the loss that they've experienced. And we certainly want to remember so many individuals, uh, both locally and frankly around the world that have lost their lives or are dealing with this dreaded virus. Uh, please keep them all in your prayers. Let's start our time together this afternoon with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Father, we are indeed thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day you've given us. We thank you for the portion of health and we pray for those, Father, that are not having good health this afternoon. We pray for those, Father, that are going through such a turmoil with this dreaded virus, not only locally, but around the world, Father. And we pray that this might come to an end soon, that you'll look down upon us and have mercy upon us. Father, we pray for those that have lost loved ones. We ask that you be with them and comfort them. For our first responders, Father, we ask you to look down and bless them and suit out those things that they need. Give them comfort, give them strength, give them the ability and the knowledge and the wisdom to do the jobs that they need to do. Father, we pray that you'll go with us in the upcoming weeks, that you'll be with us, watch over and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we began looking at depression and Lord willing, the next Sunday morning, we are going to continue to look at that topic and we're going to look at Moses and some of the things that he dealt with in his life and how he dealt with those things. But I said tonight, we're going to talk about spiritual isolation. What does that mean? Well, we're going to look at a couple of examples tonight. One over in uh, Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the other we're going to look at over in 1 Kings chapter 5, or excuse me, 2 Kings chapter 5, and that is Naaman. But first, let's talk about uh, Acts chapter 8. Let's look at the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, so many are familiar with the story there. Of course, the book of Acts is where we began looking at the Lord's church. We see its beginnings there in the book of Acts. And I suppose you can call the book of Acts the book of conversions as well, because that's what it is. It's folks getting the start there in the church, finding out what they need to do. And the common thread that we see that runs through the book of Acts, where remission of sins uh, was granted that was through total obedience, through their belief, through their repentance, confession, and certainly through baptism, the watery grave of baptism. But let's begin with the Ethiopian eunuch, as I said, in Acts chapter 8. And as we begin this, let's take a trip back. And as we look at Philip, Philip was told by the Holy Spirit, by our Lord, to join up with the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch was the treasurer uh, from Ethiopia, uh, the secretary of the treasure from Ethiopia. And as he was riding along in a chariot, of course, he has one that is driving the chariot and he is in the back. He has this scroll. And as Philip joins up with the Ethiopian eunuch, he asks, do you understand what you are reading? And this, of course, we find uh, that Philip says uh, there, how can I unless someone explain it to me? And of course, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from the uh, 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Now, at this time, we find that Philip is going to go where the Ethiopian eunuch is in Isaiah and bring him to where he needs to be in explaining to him about the Christ, the Son of the living God, and what it is that he needs to do. And when you look at verse 38 and 39 of Acts chapter 8, we read the following. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way <coughs> rejoicing. Now, what's interesting here is the fact that the Ethiopian eunuch turned and said to Philip, Here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, if baptism was simply an outward sign of an inward confession, who exactly is it that we find the Ethiopian eunuch confessing to? Now, that's a little side note in where we're going here, but 
Just something to kind of plant the seed and the thought in your mind. The Ethiopian eunuch did not wait till he got back to Ethiopia. The Ethiopian eunuch took care of what he needed to take care of right then and there. Whether in the book of Acts, whether it was 12 noon or 12 midnight, those that were converted to Christ did not wait till the next time they got together with a group of individuals in order to confess or say they believed or whatever it is that they felt like, man felt like they needed to do. We find that at midnight or 12 noon, they were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. That's the key phrase that you'll see each and every time that we find salvation coming about. So here we have the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip together, and now we find them going down into water, coming up out of water, and we find Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch now separated. Now, what's interesting here and where we get into the topic of spiritual isolation, when we find the Ethiopian unit going back to Ethiopia, we find that there were probably no one there that he could relate to, no one there that he could really rejoice with, and we hope he was able to continue to be faithful because as he went back, he was probably isolated. He was probably isolated from those because there was so many uh, so much more teaching that was going on that was contrary to the will of God and certainly didn't include Christ Jesus, that maybe he would feel completely isolated from the truth and from what he had and the rejoicing and the joy that he felt uh, in Christ Jesus as he was with Philip. So Philip told him what he needed to do, but what did he do? The Ethiopian eunuch, that is, what did he do when he got back to Ethiopia? There's no doubt that his joy was real. His salvation was in Christ. This changed his life. We don't know what happened. The story stops there. But isolation is something you might be feeling now too. Not so much because you're outside of Christ. You may be. And if that's the case, you certainly need to get in Christ Jesus. And you need to do the same thing that the Ethiopian eunuch did. You need to do the same thing that we find throughout the book of Acts, whether it's those on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, whether it's Saul of Tarsus, who later became the apostle Paul, whether it was Lydia or the jailer, you need to do the exact thing they did when they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's water, what doth hinder me? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The question was asked and the answer was given. And it all ended with the same answer. Depending on where they were, they ultimately had to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. It was true in the first century, and it is certainly true today. And that invitation remains open to you today, right now, to do the exact same thing. All you've got to do is call some of us. Let some of us know. You can certainly message us here on Facebook. You can uh, call us up, uh, 901-413-9932. It's all there, folks. And you can certainly let us know that your interest is there, and that will certainly be taken care of. So when we began to look at this, and when we began to talk about isolation, we talk about separation, we look forward to the time that we can get back together. I know we do. We all do. We're all going a little stir-crazy with this. But we need to stay steadfast in what we're doing in hopes that within the weeks to come, things will change. Spiritual isolation is not something new, uh, even though it's new to a lot of folks today. As I've mentioned in several different uh, lessons, uh, we certainly want to remember our shut-ins, and now we get to see what they feel like day in and day out. You see, there's a good side to this. We don't normally look at viruses or diseases as having a good side, but it allows us, as I said this morning, to slow down, to listen to what God has to say to us through his word and to spend more time in devotion to his word and finding out exactly where we are. We want to be safe again. We want to feel safe again. As the child of God, we certainly are able to do that. And so I want to share a different story now with you. And as I said, that's one that we look at in 2 Kings 5. It begins with a man uh, who was actually the commander of the army for the king of Syria. Uh, not, not particularly a friend of Israel. His name was Naaman. Now, Naaman had a deadly disease, scary. And 
frightening, much like what so many are going through today in, in fear that one is going to catch this virus today. This was the disease that was commonly called and applied to so many. It was called leprosy. And uh, kind of a general category, but it was severe. It was a skin condition. Uh, and uh, there's a lot we don't know about it, but we know that it was something that folks stayed clear of. Uh, again, much like the separation, the isolation, and the quarantine that we find today. And so when we look at this, what we know is that a young girl who was captured by the Assyrians became Naaman's uh, uh, wife's slave, spake about a man that could cure him. Now, if I was to offer that cure today to the virus that is plaguing our world today, I venture to say that those that have it or those that have loved ones that have uh, caught that disease would give any amount of money would give whatever they have in order that they might have a cure for that disease. And here we're going to find a cure that doesn't cost anything but one obey. That's Naaman. Here we find the idea that we're going to find the man of God saying, listen, here's what you need to do. And what you need to do is you need to dip seven times in this river, in this water. Now, Naaman wasn't so pleased with that. To make a long story short, after he was told to dip seven times in the Jordan, that muddy river, uh, he finally was willing to do it. He surely didn't understand exactly why he had to dip seven times in that old muddy Jordan. But I will assure you, when he dipped once, it didn't do him any good. When he did it two times, three times, four, five, and six times, he came up and he still had all the leprosy on his skin that he had before he got into that old muddy Jordan. And he may have even thought to himself, hey, I'm just as diseased as I was when I went in the, uh, to begin with. But when he dipped that seventh time, his skin was as clean as a baby's skin. And in chapter five, verse 14, beginning, Look what is said there in 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, there are, now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, as the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. But Naaman said, shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two, two mules, a uh, burden of earth, for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Here is another man who felt isolated. Why did he feel isolated? Well, let me tell you, when he went back, when he went back to his home, when he went back into uh, the area of Syria, there was all these strange gods. Well, those were not the gods that Naaman wanted to worship. Naaman was full of joy now because the God of Israel, the only true and living God then and today, is the one that cured him. But when he went back into Syria, there was going to be all of these other strange gods. But he wanted to continue to remember the one God, the God of Israel. The interesting part is this gift of an instant cure that was offered free of charge. And Naaman learned some great lessons from this one gift. The best lesson was that there is but only one God. Now, folks, that's not a politically correct statement today, but it is a scripturally correct statement. There is one God. Paul recognized that in Ephesians chapter 4 when he said, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. There is but one, no matter what the world may say. So he learned that. And to say that he was filled with joy would be a tremendous understatement. But there was a problem. And that's where Naaman comes in and says, 
Can I have one more thing? Now, we don't know exactly why he asked for the one more thing. We don't know why he asked for two mule loads of dirt. Doesn't really reveal why, but he did. He did ask. He asked for a second gift. Now, you would think after this first gift, as great as it was, that there would be no need for a second. He'd gotten a cure, but here's the second request. And the reason, as I said before, is because this man knew when he went back, he was going to be spiritually isolated. A man who had a job in a world that didn't believe, yet he was a believer. So Naaman asked for a second gift, and it was to reinforce that relationship with God and help him in the trials and the tribulations and the troubles that he would be facing when he was isolated. How is your faith doing you right now? Now that you're in isolation, now that you've been quarantined, you may be alone, as I mentioned this morning, but you're not alone. You're not alone. You'll always have God. You'll always have Christ, if indeed he is your Savior. So many of us today, not being able to gather together, not being able to fellowship, not being able to have those good potlucks, not being able to share in the wonderful things that we're able to share in. There's so many of us today that are missing those times with church family. It's missing those times. Maybe it's time for us to get two mule loads of dirt, folks. <laughs> Maybe it's time for us to get our attitude right. Maybe it's time for us to get our priorities straight and to realize who God is. But let's start by affirming that number one, that there is but one God. We know that. If you're in Christ Jesus right now, you know there is but one God. There is no other. And if you're not in Christ Jesus right now, you need to know right now you can call on everything else, but there's nothing else or no one else that can save you, that can give you that home in heaven that can tell you those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. But this one God, this one God. The ground in Israel was no more holy than the ground in Syria. But Naaman knew he was going to be alone spiritually. He knew that. I don't know what he did with that dirt. Maybe it was to be a reminder uh, of his cure and, and to remind him of Jehovah. I don't know, but he knew. And I think it's high time that you and I get our two mule loads of dirt together. By that, I mean it's time for us to make sure that we are staying connected to God, even though we're away from the building, even though we're away from one another. It's time for us to make sure we're staying connected with God. And I've said it this morning, and I'll say it every time we come together. You do that certainly by your time of meditating and meditation in the Word of God. Not just times like this. No more than when we're together at the building should it be just Sunday and Wednesday. It should be seven days a week that we find our closeness to God, our relationship to God being so real. Just because you're not in the building doesn't mean that you're isolated from God. God will never leave you nor forsake you. I know that our connection now is more through technology. We're doing what we have to do, but we still have the good old fashioned phone that we're able to call one another up. You're not alone. Take your spiritual dirt, keep that holy ground that you have, and continue to worship God in spirit and in truth. Would you bow with me as we close? Father, thank you for the spiritual truth that we have. Thank you for the light that shines so bright, and that is your son, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to realize now, and as long as you allow us to live on the face of this earth, and for eternity, Father, there is but one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have in him. And we pray, Father, that we will look to you. We will look to him. And Father, we will be strengthened day in and day out, knowing, Father, that we can get through this, not on our own, 
but because you are there with us. Forgive us where we've fallen short, Father. Help us to be strong. Help us to be the example to our community and to all of our neighbors around, to our faithfulness to you and our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.